Welcome, thank you for coming. Uh, as you see here, the objective of this talk is uh, use of scientific and uh, assumptions to prove the existence of the spiritual realm and inner workings of the creator and how the creator influences intelligent life. And of course, ever advancing civilization, how this is coming about, and of course through progressive revelation. And this is what we're trying to address. How does uh, basically creator control this creation? In w with what means does it? Of course, uh, as any endeavor, we start with known scientific facts, uh, like th th thermodynamics, laws, and then we extrapolate uh, the result. One thing uh, for people that have uh, uh, heard my talks before, we use purely objective scientific uh, methodology. So there is nothing here that uh, uh, refers to non-scientific me methods uh, overall. So uh, there is a, uh, to start with, we start with a prophecy. Actually, the Shia Islam believes that the 99 well-known names of God is already revealed, and the 101, which is the name of the Messiah, this is the uh, basically return of uh, Christ with Sunni Muslims and return of Imam Hussein for Shiite, uh, and of course the uh, return of Jesus for Christians, this Messiah, the name was, would be revealed by the 12th Imam, and uh, so you had to wait until 12th Imam comes back, and he would reveal the name of the Messiah. And most of the uh, Judeo-Christian-based uh, monotheic religions wait for these two comings, basically. So Baha'is believe, obviously, Bob was uh, uh, return of Imam, 12th Imam, and he proclaimed name of Baha to be the name of the Messiah. So it's interesting uh, that uh, this fellow called Baha'uddin Muhammad ibn Hussein, he was a scholar. Uh, and he discovered this name 300 years before Baha'i religion actually was uh, started. He was a scholar, philosopher, architect, mathematician, astronomer, poet of 16th century Iran. And he chose the pen name of Baha because he discovered that name. And uh, that's why they call him Sheikh Baha'i, means that the guy who discovered this. So, uh, to show you how Islam uh, advanced and what kind of philosophy it had, I chose one of his uh, poems, which is quite interesting. And I did rough translation, so I apologize for that. Uh, this is for practice of religion. This is every day fasting, every night praying, every year traveling to Hejaz for the sake of pilgrimage, going barefoot from Mecca to Medina, going to open your two lips, dutifully praising God, turning to mosque and temples for guidance, turning away from all that are forbidden and lustful, every Friday night not sleeping and communing with God, every moment petitioning for a need from his needless being. None of them, I swear to God, has as much effect as opening for a hopeless, the closed door of hope. So you see, obviously, philosophies, Islamic philosophies, uh, had uh, blossoms during those ages. Uh, and what you see and hear today may be completely different than, than the zenith of uh, Islamic culture in general. I'm going to read this in Farsi, which has a, a very interesting tone. همه روز روز رفتن همه شب نماز کردن همه سال حج نمودن سفر حجاز کردن ز مدینه تا به مکه به پر... به برهن پای رفتن دو لب از برای لبیک به وظیف باز کردن به معابد و مساجد همه اکتکاف جستن 
ز مناهی و ملاهی همه احتراز کردن شب جمعه ها نخفتن به خدای راز گفتن ز وجود بی نیازش طلب نیاز کردن به خدا قسم که آن را سمر آنقدر نباشد که به روی ناامیدی در بسته باز کردن So this uh, really shows the practice of religion is, is the goal, not praying to God. Uh, so we're going to start with the uh, basic laws of physics that is uh, common and everybody agrees, uh, and it applies everywhere. So you can't escape these laws. And the, these are laws of thermodynamics. The first law says that is the law of con conservation of matter. State that matter energy cannot be created, nor can it be destroyed. So the total number of mass and energy in the universe is always constant. It may change from solid to uh, liquid to gas to plasma and go back to solid again. So basically nothing escapes, nothing gets added, nothing gets subtracted in the entire universe. The second law, it says this law of, law of increase of entropy. This is very, very important, and most of the talk is based on this particular law, which is quite interesting. Why quantity of energy and matter doesn't change, the quality of it changes. That means that energy turns from a useful energy to basically unuseful energy. What is unuseful energy? It's basically heat. So the energy of these systems, whatever it is in universe, eventually deteriorates and becomes constant. That means nothing moves. This is end of the universe in general. So this law says order or evolution of a system toward order is improbable. It's not possible. And the disorder or the degeneration toward disorder is a probable natural configuration. That means that if you have a jumbo jet 747, if billion years of passes by, that jumbo jet turns to dust. But if you wait billions of years, nothing from dust becomes a 747. So always energy goes to its natural state, deteriorates. So that's the second law of uh, thermodynamics. And what it says is basically is uh, perpetual machines are provably impossible. That means there is no machine that would run forever. Eventually it uses its energy and dies. This is natural state of, of all phenomenon in universe. They all follow the same way. And I'll describe this a little bit later, becomes very clear. The third one, which is very simple, it says that uh, there is a point in the whole universe that nothing moves, or the movement is to its minimum. And that's really what's called Kelvin zero. What is temperature? Temperature is used to describe how hot or cold an object is. The temperature of an object depends on how fast its atoms and molecules oscillate. At absolute zero, these oscillations are the slowest they can possibly be. Even at absolute zero, the motion doesn't completely die, but is in a state of basically non-movement. That means the universe exhausted its energy. So that's zero Kelvin. Now, although these laws of thermodynamics apply in every scientific discipline, every biological, geological process, every instellar system works everywhere. So the ideas that don't follow this rule are either wrong or must be caused by some supernatural, we can call it transmaterial influence, uh, generally. So, for example, perpetual motion machines are provably impossible according to the laws of thermodynamics. The first law shows that energy matter cannot be created from nothing, and second law shows that the closed system will degrade its own energy. So 
a machine that runs forever without external energy source is either fictional or powered by some unnatural source. So this is, now let's build one. So here uh, you have a turbine, you have wind coming in, you have inflow wind activates rotor and blades. Rotor and blades spin the main shaft and gearbox, which spins the generator, resulting in electric output. This is standard uh, turbine. Electric fan, everybody knows the wind, you plug it into electricity and it starts generating wind, right? So here, let us build a machine that works forever. We have a small battery, electric fan, and a wind turbine. A small battery starts the electric fan, electric fan generates wind, Wind turns the wind turbines, wind turbines generate electricity, electricity charges the battery. So we should have a perpetual machine, right? Circle and if it's, the problem with this is that the original energy that was in the battery slowly turns to heat and eventually dies. So you cannot make a machine that runs forever. Nothing in the universe can run forever because of second law of thermodynamics. We're going to use this quite often. So in subatomic universe, there are some theories that in a fraction of uh, time, sometimes the, in subatomic uh, level, a brief quantum of time, this law gets violated, but it's so minute, and these are theories. But in a general sense, all laws of thermodynamics work all the time. Now, this question becomes very interesting. So who created the universe? Now, of course, fundamental laws of matter and energy laws of thermodynamics are used to measure truth in every other discipline. Some scientists ignore them, basically, to, to provide theories about what they like to say, which sometimes violates these laws. If matter cannot be created, where did it come from? Obviously, we said this is, nothing gets added, nothing gets subtracted. So where it came from, basically? It is certainly here, and nothing natural can create it. No natural known entity can create matter or energy. So this makes supernatural or transmaterial source more than just a possible conclusion. It makes it the only conclusion that fits the law of thermodynamics. Right? So if something exists when natural law says it cannot be, then something or someone operating outside of those laws must be responsible, because we know it's here, right? So the laws of thermodynamics lead us not only to greater knowledge of natural universe, but they point us toward answers outside of the universe as well. So this is really the key. Now, we found that obviously there is a creator, trans material creator that created this universe uh, based on first law of thermodynamics. Now, uh, Dr. Hatcher, which is one of the eight Platonist philosophers listed for the second half of the 20th century, mathematically proved, this is proven, that there is a creator for whole reality, which is self-caused phenomenon. The creator is simple, it's non-composite, -comp the creator is unique universal creator, cause of every existent phenomenon. There is only one creator for whole reality. And if you look closely, all of the religious uh, doctrines uh, promote exactly the same thing. If you uh, get interested, I can uh, email you the book. I have the PDF of it also. He's been actually a professor of mathematics and taught in many universities in uh, Canada, US, and Russia, uh, and the book is available. So now we know, based on first law of thermodynamics, that there is a transmaterial creator that is outside three dimension and time. 
Now, we want to see, can a creator exist without creation? Can the creator be by himself and no creation? Obviously, this is not possible because that unique creator of whole reality is self-caused. Based on first law, nothing gets added or subtracted, right? So, physical reality creation and creator must, ha must have existed simultaneously. Because the physical reality has been here forever. There is no beginning, there is no end to it. And of course, creator must, is this, how could creation exist before its creator? That's not possible. So now, therefore, creator and creation always existed. So you can mathematically prove that what we see, as far as creator and universe, always existed and always will exist. Now, we want to see is that can this universe be devoid of intelligent life? Can it be just material, nothing else? Let's find out if that was the case. Now, if, if physical reality didn't have intelligent life, the whole creation would have no meaning whatsoever. Why? Because there can't be anyone that could re actually recognize the creator if there is no intelligent life. If you couldn't basically recognize the creator, his existence would be completely unknown. Whether it was there or not, we didn't have any impact, right? Because he would be alone and nobody would know he exists. So this intelligent life is a integral part of creation itself. And of course, virtues of, of creator would have been completely hidden also. When you say, God is benevolent, God is love, if there is no, no one can recognize and he could exercise his virtues, right? That wouldn't be a creator. That wouldn't be God. So the key is that intelligent life exists throughout the universe. Not only maybe on Earth, it may be in many other places as well. Now, when does it get created? Life, intelligent life will get created when the material condition necessary for life is present. So it can be anywhere in the universe. So this universe without the intelligent life has no meaning whatsoever. Now, now we have to define what is intelligent life. Now, obviously we said there should be someone that can recognize this creator. So intelligent life has the power of intellect. Creation can recognize the creator. It should have a self-awareness and capacity to, to discover it, the whole reality. Now, intelligent will not be able to de detect a transmaterial entity like creator if it was solely a material entity. We know based on physics, you only can detect elements that are within time and space, three dimensions. You can build a machine that can recognize anything in this three dimension and time, but you can't recognize anything outside. So, Scratching our head, it says, how would we recognize the creator then if there is no machine that can actually detect something outside time and basically three dimension? This forces humans or intelligent life to have a component that is really transmaterial. Because without it, we couldn't recognize the Creator. So, what, 
that entity is called, obviously religious doctrine, call it soul, spirit, or conscience. So there is something, you can't detect it, you can't measure it, but it's there. We know it's there. So for us to be able to detect him, we have to have that component, transmaterial component. So soul is a simple and unique entity that has a beginning at the time of conception, but lasts forever. So your soul will last forever. There is no element called time in transmaterial dimension. Because there is no physical reality in spiritual dimension. So time has no meaning. So we found that this intelligent life has a component called soul, which is transmaterial, and it's not detectable. You can build a device that can detect it. Now, we, want, we have these questions that pops up, that does creator influence physical reality? Actually, is the physical reality on autopilot? I mean, many people believe that God created this and just left the law and seeing from the top and laughing at us how, how we operate. <laughs> and doesn't interfere at all. So creator created the creation and left it alone. Is that the case? So based on second law of thermodynamics, no perpetual motion machine can exist in the universe. We, we, we said that. that, that's impossible. Now, if we find such a phenomenon, right? Based on second law of thermodynamics, it must have transmaterial source because it's there. If it's there, it's a perpetual machine, the source of it cannot be in physical reality, cannot be in three dimension and time. It has to be outside. So what is this? If you look closely at civilization or order, which is ever advancing since history of man began to, to present day, we have found a phenomenon that like a perpetual motion machine is advancing all the time and violating the second law of thermodynamics. If this is the case, then it must have a transmaterial source. So civilization is continually, continually increasing. It's ever advancing civilization. We came from caves, communal uh, living, to primitive man, primitive societies to do today, which is basically modern sciences, modern uh, spirituality, you have uh, governments, so civilization is increasing. We found something that violates thermodynamics law. And it's here, we can see it, and it's increasing all the time. So the only transmaterial source we know that exists based on the first law of thermodynamics and mathematically proven is creator. So therefore, creator must be the source of this civilization. Right? That's the only one we know. That is outside time and space. So state of randomness and disorder is the natural state, of, is state not order. This is second law of thermodynamics. So we found something, therefore, that violates this law. Therefore, it must have a transmaterial source. So here, how does creator influence his creation? So now we're coming to see how does he do it? Any material intervention by God into physical reality would be detected by us. Why? because we would detect an energy that came from nowhere. We can detect it, but there is no such a thing. So, what happens is, therefore, God or Creator doesn't influence physical reality materially. Although, to tell you about uh, physics, even they have gone beyond the three dimension and time to define unified force theory, which is, they say, the gravity, electromagnetic 
weak nuclear force and a strong nuclear force really is one force. And these are weightless quantum of energy that oscillate in 11 different dimensions and create the reality we see. So even in the physics, mathematically, they have proven that you can have more than three dimensions. So what we experience today can have multiple dimensions as well. So, uh, so this proves really that any creator's influence has to be transmaterial. Otherwise, we would have detected it. That extra energy is entering our system, which is not. Now, how does civilization, civilization advance with a transmaterial source? We know that this civilization source is God, right? Creator. And does creator really directly control man or this intelligent life? Now, if creator controlled man, what would have happened? This intelligent life. Then that person wouldn't be intelligent life anymore because it would be dictated by a God, had no free will whatsoever. So, God doesn't really control man directly. The man's transmaterial source is created at the time of con conception, has free will, limited capacity, and subjective mind. So this person cannot be the source of civilization because he learns as he goes, and he has no source that he can receive this. He can't even receive directly messages from God, because if he did, he would be under control of God, and he would be a programmed machine. So what ends up happening here is that man is not the source of civilization, a spiritual civilization. So there must be an intermediary. The intermediary between creator and man are the prophets. Prophet's soul is ancient, pre-existent. That's why they're different than the soul of man. So this soul has to have innate knowledge of physical reality and spiritual reality. And these prophets are omniscient at will. They do whatever God wants. They don't do anything for themselves, and they execute whatever God says. So this is really the intermediary that exists between God and man. Now, with what means creator influences the physical reality? What methodology, what is the transport that this influence is, is happening with? So there must be a transmaterial medium that we cannot detect that he talks to the prophet. Otherwise, we would have detected it. So this medium itself has to be transmaterial as well. So, basically, God talks to this uh, ancient soul that the, the manifestation have with a spiritual or uh, spiritual force. In religious term, they call it Holy Spirit, basically. In Baha'i terms, the Holy Spirit is really synonymous with the writings of the prophet that generate their spirit. Somebody reads it, suddenly they get disturbed, actually. Where did this come from? They can, they can feel it. So this medium, so prophets are the only recipient of the holy text from God. So that's the, and the medium is the Holy Spirit. Again, undetectable. It has to be transmaterial. Now, We said that, obviously, the only known entity we know outside time and uh, three dimension is, uh, is the creator. So he must be the source of civilization. Now, Baha'u'llah describes this as quite interesting. And I was reading this, and it was quite intriguing how this correlates to something physical. 
He says the Holy Spirit itself has been generated through the agency of a single letter revealed by his, this most great spirit. If ye be of them that comprehend. If you look at DNA, what is DNA of humans? It's actually carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, right? And hydrogen. Now, how can you put elements, each element together, and suddenly this thing becomes life? It's the same thing here. There are billions and trillions of permutation of these carbons, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. None of them turns to be life. How did this human become life, become intelligent? Same way, you can put words, letters together, has no spirit whatsoever. When God puts them together, it creates that spirit. It becomes life. The writings of God becomes life and becomes that Holy Spirit. So that's how he communicates with the prophets. And of course, he's everywhere and is available to everyone. Now, religion and civilization. Now, if you look closely, religion is created to Holy Spirit by prophets. They write a book, they give it to us, right? But like any other phenomenon in universe, religion is subject to second law of thermodynamics. It would die eventually, right? So, and deteriorate time. And all of them, all of them, without exception, all prophets announce the coming of next personage. They say, someone will come after me to renew my religion. So even religion is not escaping second law of thermodynamics. So here, religion with deteriorate with transmaterial. So Without this transmaterial infusion of Holy Spirit, the religion would die. So that Holy Spirit renews with every new prophet by the Creator. So therefore, religion has to perpetually be renewed, which is progressive revelation, for civilization to be ever advancing, defying the second law of thermodynamics. So there is no alternative to this. Otherwise, the religion would die away. So God sends new messengers, progressively send them to make sure civilization goes on. So, so far the story is pretty clear, and we see that we are subject to the second law of thermodynamics as well. Now, so the Creator is sitting there through Holy Spirit, sends it to His prophets, and prophets with their ancient soul, that they know other manifestations and they have knowledge of time before all physical reality, sciences, and spiritual reality, and they come successively to teach man. So they really, there is only one religion of God. So Judaism, Christianity, Zoroastrianism, Muslim religion, Baha'i religion, these are continuation of the same religion. There is only one religion, really. So this proves methodology of, of how the Creator keeps infusing this Holy Spirit into physical reality to make this perpetually growing uh, civilization. Okay, so now, now when does he, the question becomes of when does he, the creator, basically guide? When does he de send these messengers? We know why he sends them. We'll, we'll see how, why he sends them as well. So the phenomenon prophet that can communicate with intelligent life has to have dual nature, obviously, has to have an appearance like us, otherwise we would not accept them. Uh, physical body, but uh, so not to violate the, the physical reality laws. 
and of course, his soul has to be able to have capacity to communicate with God and receive this Holy Spirit that we discuss. And he would need to have innate knowledge. He doesn't go to school here and he doesn't acquire knowledge from other people. He has all the knowledge. So soul of the manifestations, soul of these individual messengers, prophet, are ancient and all have the knowledge, past, present, and future of the whole reality. Prophets appear when humanity has sunk into an abyss of despair and moral standards are all but disappeared. And in religious terms, they call it covered in sin. That's where the new manifestation comes in, to really rescue civilization. So prophets being infallible, reflecting will of God through Holy Spirit, bring humanity back to the right path of advancing civilization. So that's the source that doesn't let civilization die. And these new prophets come in when things go seriously bad. Now, let's see what Baha'u'llah says about uh, this subject. My God, my God, if none be found to stray from thy path, how then can the ensign of thy mercy be unfurled or the banner of thy bountiful favor be hoisted? And if inequity be not committed, what is it that can proclaim thee to be the concealer of men's sin, the ever-forgiving, the omniscient, the all-wise? May my soul be a sacrifice to the trespasses of them that trespass against thee. For upon such trespasses are wafted the sweet savors of the tender mercies of thy name, the compassionate, the all-merciful. May my inmost being be offered up for the sins of them that have sinned against thee, for it is as a result of such sin that the day star of thy manifold favors revealeth itself by the horizon of thy bounty. And the clouds of thy never-failing providence rain down their gifts upon the realities of the all-created things. So what happens is that the manifestation come in because people go astray. The second law of thermodynamics, which is applicable to human and prior religion, takes its toll. Religion deteriorates to a point where civilization would die. If the new infusion of energy, transmaterial energy, doesn't come in, and that's through the manifestation. And Baha'u'llah attests to that. If these guys wouldn't go astray, I wouldn't be here. So ever advancing civilization and correlated to progressive revelation, so spiritual capacity and knowledge of man increases by time. Therefore, messengers who come through ages to reflect the will of creator for the everlasting civilization, man's has free will, it can accept reality, diffuse by the prophets, or ignore them, and bear the consequences of violation of those laws, putting humanity at the mercy of the second law of thermodynamics, or nature, and move toward disorder and destruction. Now, we can clearly see laws that came in from Baha'i religion, latest manifestation, and how humanity ignored most of them during the 20th century. So humanity suffered greatly in the 20th century by ignoring spiritual laws, latest manifestation. And you see wars that created first, second world war. The, we killed the, uh, humanity, humans, in 20th century more than the entire history of man combined. We killed more. And all of it was because we weren't following latest manifestation of God's instruction. So let's see what Baha'u'llah says about this. Perceive it the disease and prescribe it the remedy. The all-knowing physician had his finger on the pulse of mankind. He perceived the disease, prescribed in his unerring wisdom the remedy. Every age had its own problem and every soul its particular aspiration. The remedy the world needed in its present day afflictions can never be the same as that which a subsequent age may require. So it's fairly obvious. Be anxiously concerned with the needs of the age ye live in 
and center your deliberation on its exigencies and requirements. Basically, Baha'u'llah is asking you to be a seeker. Go find out what are those exigencies that would save humanity. So what are these golden rules that we violated in 20th century? How many wars was because of uh, nationalism? How many wars was because of discrimination? We had a couple of wars in the United States ourselves because of uh, race, for example. All of it because we violated these. Unity of God. Remember, these laws came in hundred. 60 years ago, unity of religion, unity of humankind, equality of, between man and woman. It's only less than 90 years that women can vote in this country, and this is supposed to be the, the most advanced country spiritually and, and uh, legally in the world. It's only 90 years that they can vote before they couldn't vote. Baha'is... Baha'i women could vote, they could divorce their husband, they could inherit wealth 160 years ago. Elimination of all forms of prejudices, race, gender, nationality, whatever. World peace, harmony of religion and science. A religion that doesn't match science is a false religion. That's Paolo's writing. Independent investigation of the truth. Everyone has to investigate for himself. The time that you could rely on a priest or, uh, or a learned person is gone. Everyone, as they become adult, they're responsible for their own action. Universal compulsory education. Everyone has to be educated. Universal auxiliary language. So humanity can talk to each other. Obedience to government and non-involvement in partisan politics, elimination of extreme of wealth and poverty. So if you look closely, most of the problems that we were faced in 20th century would have been resolved if everybody agreed to this. And we didn't. So what is the consequence of not uh, accepting Holy Spirit? The consequences is you fall into Second law of thermodynamics, you disintegrate. There is no alternative to it. So if you look at uh, uh, science and religion should be intertwined. When you look at material reality is observable, proven experiment, you can find physical reality. Now, transmaterial or a spiritual reality, reality that exists proven mathematic by mathematical model, like a unique creator or soul of a man. Now, we divide material reality into two segments. One is intelligent life and non-intelligent life. The intelligent life is the one that can recognize creator. The non-intelligent life falls into the second law of thermodynamics, that means disappears. How many species have been ex extinct on Earth? Because they fall, they don't have any soul. They fall into that category, which is love universe. So if you divide to see how parallel science and religion goes, Whole reality is material reality, is spiritual reality. Material reality is two segments, natural sciences, which we prove and is cumulatively, and then social sciences. Guess what? The social sciences are, are not fixed. It changes by behavior of human changes. So even material sciences have a fixed portion and a variable portion. Same thing with spiritual reality. Virtues of God, no religion came in that says God is not just, or God is not benevolent, God is not love. So all the virtues in all religions are the same, same way as the natural sciences. Objectively prove that is necessary for 
survival of the humanity. And then there is a social interaction laws, which, which changes also as new religion comes in, as new Holy Spirit come in, bringing this law which is changed because of obviously if they don't come, we fall into second law of thermodynamics and our religion would die if it's not renewed. What is social science's objective study of human behavior, which is variable? What is social interaction that comes in religion, revealed material laws, ritual and rites? So they're, they're in parallel, in tandem. Same way our understanding of sciences grows and is objective, it doesn't change, the same way these virtues that has been it forever stays with us and will not change. So what is the source of true knowledge? There's two ways, true science and true revelation. Discovery by intelligent life. So we're discovering those sciences and revelation, those messages come through the prophet. So these are the two methods of true knowledge. So now let's, let's do a, a wrap up, a conclusion of what we saw. What, how does scientific discovery works is bottom up. You start with few assumptions that is true, and then you extrapolate and create mathematical laws, laws of physics, and so on and so forth. In spiritual discovery is top down. That means that revelation gives you a general idea and then you apply it to the particular cases. So this is the two method. And combination of the two creates the ever, and, ad, ever advancing civilization. So you have a material civilization, you have a spiritual civilization. One without the other would not survive. And this, this is by intercession of God. That means that through this a spiritual force, which is transmaterial, God gives this material to the prophets. The prophets come to this world. They see things. They prescribe what is necessary to pull humanity back into the right track. Uh, so creator, through the prophets, brings this new energy into the civilization. So offer a remedy, which is the new religion, to make sure the humanity survives. So laws that we, we uh, proved, there is one creator, there is intelligent life in creation that can recognize, can is the, the word, uh, the creator, because it has free will, the creator's spiritual force is the driver of ever advancing civilization. The creator sends manifestations to direct his intelligent life. Obviously, prophets creating religions. The creator does not interfere in physical reality materially. The creator interferes spiritually with a spiritual force in the whole reality influencing intelligent life, in turn, physical reality gets affected. So religion of prophets are the source of ever advancing civilization. The religion from the creator is progressive and cumulative. Intelligent life or creation, man is created in the image of creator, can develop attributes of the creator. So this is basically ever advancing civilization. We were humanoids, communal living. We came to primitive man, a start of civilization, tribal society, and today this is where we are. So we have material civilization, again, spiritual civilization. What is an efficient cause? So what works in those material laws that come from Holy Spirit is the most efficient way to make humanity, bring the humanity back to doing good, avoiding sin. So this efficient cause may not be the same because humanity changes throughout ages. 
So if you want to apply, for example, the, this uh, spiritual laws that came from physical reality of during Christ's time, obviously it wouldn't apply today because the humanity has changed. The problems are different. So all variable portion of spiritual laws are the most efficient methodology to deal with challenges and maladies of the time period that they are intended for. So they solve the problem for that period. The minute, for example, Islam came in, the Christianity and uh, Europeans uh, contest to that, that during, for example, uh, between 6th to 14th century, which the Islam was in its zenith, they called uh, Europe uh, was in dark ages. Obviously, sun was coming up. That means that civilization, Christian civilization, had de deteriorated, deteriorated to such a degree that was dark ages, basically. What Christians were doing at that time had no resemblance of what Christ had told them to do. So this is really critical to know that this new culture and societies come in because the new prophets bring in this Holy Spirit to us. Now, let's see what uh, Shoghi Effendi, uh, the guardian of the faith, uh, after Abdul Baha, says about golden age of civilization. The formative period, the iron age of that dispensation, Baha'i dispensation was now beginning. The age in which the institution, local, national, and international of the faith of Baha'u'llah were to take shape, develop, and become fully consolidated in anticipation of the third, the last, the golden ages destined to witness the emergence of the world embracing order, enshrining the ultimate fruit of God's last revelation to mankind, a fruit whose maturity must signalize the establishment of the world civilization and the formal inauguration of the kingdom of the Father upon earth as promised by Jesus Christ himself. So there is really no alternative. We get there because it's ever advanced civilization. The tools we need to use is the Holy Spirit, which is for today. And it would take, take us there where we want to go. Now, what is the potency of universal religion? This is from Baha'u'llah. From the heaven of God's will and for the purpose of the ennobling the world of being and of elevating the minds and souls of men, hath been sent down that which is the most effective instrument for the education of the whole human race, the highest essence and most perfect expression of whatsoever the peoples of the old have either said or written, hath through this most potent revelation been sent down from the heaven of the will of the all-possessing, the ever-abiding God. So, what is the global humanity, global view of Baha'is, of humanity? Turn all your thoughts toward bringing joy to hearts. Be aware, be aware. Lest ye offend any heart, assist the world of humanity as much as possible. Be the source of consolation to every sad one. Assist every weak one. Be helpful to every indigent one. Care for every sick one. Be the cause of the glorification to every lowly one and shelter those who are overshadowed by fear. In brief, let each one of you be as a lamp shining forth with the light of the virtues of the world of humanity. Be trustworthy, sincere, affectionate, and replete with chastity. Be illumined, be spiritual, be divine, be glorious, be quickened of God, be a Baha'i. 